Palmer, uh, who's going to talk to us about a book called I Am Taurus. So it is a special treat because we don't normally focus on one thing only. So Stephen, tell us about your book. How how did you come to write this? Okay, well, let's actually, let's show you the book first. There we go. As you can see, it has rather a gorgeous cover. Um, that was designed uh, using very high-tech um, AI technology by a Canadian friend of mine. Um, before your viewers and listeners freak out, um, I can tell you that the source material for that was public domain photograph. Um, so it doesn't infringe any copyrights or anything. Um, so um, basically a couple of years ago, I turned 60 um, and Nikki, my partner, um, booked a holiday for me to celebrate this um, fairly momentous occasion. Um, and um, we went to, down to Devon, uh, which is where I used to live. Um, and it was kind of our first major holiday together. So it was a bit of a, and you know, I was about to turn 60. So it was a bit of a big thing for us. Um, and as it happened, we had a wonderful time. Um, I know Devon really well. I was able to show us some of the places that I, that I knew. Um, it was just the cottage that we stayed at was just wonderful, perfect. Um, so Nikki and I, both being big book lovers, we walked into one of the local bookshops, this little small independent shop. Um, and there in front of me on the new books table was a book by Joe Marchant. Um, now, Joe is um, a well-known and highly respected science author. She wrote a book about the Antikythera mechanism um, called Decoding the Heaven. So I knew Joe's work. Um, so this was a, a no-brainer for me. So I bought the book straight away. And this book was about um, how we use the stars and the celestial sphere at night as a metaphor for our myths. So she started off, you know, in, in ancient history and actually as our explain in a minute in prehistory and tells the story through um, the Greeks, science and all sorts of different aspects of our you know, more recent culture. But what really struck me and, and amazed me, because I, I read a lot about things like cave art. Um, my area of specialism is the evolution of consciousness. So cave art and prehistory is of great interest to me, um, was just something on the very first page where she talked about uh, the um, cave art at Lascaux in France, uh, discovered in about 1944, I think, incredibly famous, wonderful images. One of the bulls in um, the Hall of the Bulls, which is near the entrance of the Lascaux Caves, bears a remarkable resemblance to um, the constellation that we now call Taurus. Um, now, some authors in this field have um, made a little too much of chance accidents of of form of pattern matching as i call it um so we have to be very careful here that we don't overinterpret. but the fact that joe marchant um had written this the fact that um the match is very accurate and the fact that for instance little details like the the, the ball which is known as ball number 18 has six little dots above its shoulder exactly where the Pleiades star cluster is now. That said to me, okay, this isn't just imagination. This is actually is a match. Now, obviously the people of Lascaux 19,000 years ago would not have called that constellation Taurus, but they would have seen that particular image with, with the red star Aldebaran and the two um, prongs that go out. They would have looked at the aurochs bulls on the plane that they were hunting and watching and they would have seen a similarity of form and i think that explains perfectly nicely and adequately why that picture resembles the constellation of taurus so it's, it's, it's a natural human thing to to look at shapes and see what else they resemble um yeah i think you you might want to explain aurochs to the audience for those okay. who might be unfamiliar with that term. Right, so um, aurochs, uh, sometimes called aurochsen, uh, were the uh, the wild um, progenitors of cattle. So um, an aurochs bull is huge. I mean, they are absolutely, they were absolutely, they don't exist now, they, they have been 
domesticated for our cattle and are technically extinct. Um, they were massive, absolutely huge, a couple of feet higher than a, than a standard bull that we know today. Um, so these gigantic beasts were wandering the plains of Europe um, through the Ice Age, um, obviously more often Southern Europe because parts of North, North Europe were covered by the ice sheet during the Ice Age. Um, and they were hunted by, by um, prehistoric people. Um, so again, the, the exact details are uncertain, but creatures like this and um, variations on that particular species would have been domesticated around about 10,000 years ago. It's, it's impossible to be exact, um, but um, they were the progenitors of the cattle that we know today. It seems to me that it's pretty obvious why Taurus as a, a symbol, an image, would become so important um, in, in our history, in our relationship with, with nature. Because if you think about those aurochs, I mean, they must have been enormous. Um, and and to, to look at that, how could you not look at it with awe? Of you know the the size, the strength, the power, and then there is the fact that it's so large. It's going to feed a lot of people. It's going to the bone will provide uh, important material. the The leather that comes from it will provide important material. It's a really it, it's going to be a fundamental thing. And there's this strong association between the bull and fertility too. Yes. What have you found? What else have you found in terms of the associations with the bull? Well, let's look at those two materials first of all. So here is a drum, a shamanic drum made of hide. This was made by Caroline Hillier, uh, a well-known musician in Britain. Really gorgeous thing. So that, that, that comes from prehistory. Just this simple idea, this simple shape, a stretch hide. And then you were talking about the bones. I have here a flute. This was made by a friend of mine. This is made from a deer bone. Let me just see if I can get to, it technically really needs to be warmed up, but I'll just see if I can get a few notes off it. There so we, we go. got that. That's that's. So we have wonderful. bone and hide. Yes. Wow. And uh, and as you say, other things too. I mean, the the when when you, when prehistoric people killed an aurochs bull, they used everything. They they it was it was food. It was it was materials. Um, then of course. Um, that's that's the physical side of things, as you say, but we have to think about the psychological side. Um, as you rightly say, bulls and also other creatures, stags and lions in particular, were were creatures of metaphor. So I think prehistoric peoples were using exactly the ideas that you talked about, the idea that you can see an astonishing creature in its natural surrounding and feel awe. That's quite a rare experience these days. We unfortunately, for various historical reasons, have taken a step back from nature, um, largely in my view, because of, of urban and, and literate society and also the influence of the ancient Greeks. Um, but you know, before those times, an, an aurochs bull, a lion, a stag, represented really primal human emotions or wonder, fear, um, and, you know, joy as well. I mean, you know, um, we don't have to just look at negative emotions. Um, you can look at an astonishing creature, however dangerous it might be, and feel joy that you live in the same world as that creature. And I think ancient peoples, especially prehistoric peoples, using myth to um, as one of their ways of understanding the world, 
would have used these creatures as metaphors. And I think that's why Taurus appears in the sky and other, other constellations as well that um, you know, have very deep roots. Leo, for instance. So these are animals of, of power, of majesty, the, the lion, king of the jungle, there's, there's those associations. And although the deer is not part of the zodiac, it's 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 everywhere in medieval literature, it seems. Yes. Um, yeah. And so it's it's very also got very deep roots. You in your book, you you talk about the way that our ancient ancestors would have related to animals as being different. Tell us a bit more about that. Well, they would have seen them as different physically. But actually, um, they would have they would have experienced animals as siblings. Um, it's very common amongst um, people who follow animist spirituality uh, to uh, to conceive of an animal and even some you know other non animate um, parts of nature um, as having an essence. Um, I think part of the reason that this happens is that it's actually a trick of consciousness. Um, one of the um, one of the marvelous illusions of consciousness is that we use ourselves as an exemplar um, to understand the behavior of others. This is the, this is the trick of consciousness. So you know, if I see um, a friend of mine or an acquaintance who is um, crying or laughing, I know. The reason for that behavior because um, I know it from myself so I use myself as an exemplar. Now prehistoric peoples would have used that same intuitive reasoning, that same intuitive logic to um, believe and decide that other animals were the same as them. So they would have believed that other animals had interior lives um, which obviously some animals do. I mean, there are many social animals. Um, they would have, um, and just from that reason alone, they would have uh, decided that these other animals had their own stories and their own story arcs and their own, you know, passages through myth. And those ideas, I think, were coagulated into human myth. Coming back to Taurus, how do we go from this sense of power and this animal being extremely important to the need to ritually taunt it and dominate it and kill it. What's, how did this evolve? I think the answer is patriarchy. Um, I'm no fan of patriarchy, as many of my readers will know already and will tell you, should you ask them. Um, not just patriarchy, because I believe there's an underlying reason for why patriarchy has regrettably um, covered the world as, as a social norm. Um, the change happens around about very roughly um, 3000 BC, give or take a couple of thousand years. Obviously, before writing, we can hypothesize and with decent archaeology theorize about how um, pre-literate cultures who were very close to the urban revolution, the writing revolution, may have um, interacted with each other, particularly when it comes to the relationship between men and women. Um, but there's no doubt that by the time you get to, say, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that is a man's world. Um, and women still have importance, um, a lot of importance actually in some, some areas, but there's no question that by the writing of Gilgamesh, which a myth whose roots would have been way back before 3000 BC, that is talking about men taking their regrettable social norms into a much wider domain. Um, so I think that therein lies the answer. I don't, I don't think that um, human cultures before the urban revolution were matriarchal. I don't think there's ever been a matriarchy. I think they were matrilineal, certainly. Um, and I think there were elements of patriarchy. There's been a, some wonderful books written comparatively recently about, about the origins um, of patriarchy 
um, a terrific book by Angela Saini called The Patriarchs, which I highly recommend as um, a very level-headed, interesting, um, and kind of um, um, the, the, the kind of message of this book is that actually patriarchy and the norms that we, we suppose to be normal in Western society are actually quite extreme. In fact, we human beings are very good at devising all sorts of unusual, helpful, egalitarian, practical social arrangements. But unfortunately, we're kind of stuck in a, in a, you know, in, in a patriarchal um, lock, which is a bit of a shame. But I think that's that's basically what happened. Men have this this desire to show control and dominance, and the ball becomes a symbol of that. I think. I would I would suggest that it's not just men. And I think that this is more about a human need to quell fear. Because if we're looking at nature and the power of nature, and we're looking at storms, animals that can devour or trample or there is an understandable reaction which would be to control it yes and, and through that then dominate and suppress and i think coming back to you you were talking about the ancient greeks primarily and i think it's that notion of what civilization is the yes. desire to be civilized meaning to be separate from nature i think yes. that's that's a, a very important um, distinction. And we haven't lost that. It's sophisticated cuisine means that you no longer know what's on your plate. Um, processed food, a, a mark of civilization, you don't know what's on your plate anymore. So true. And, and, it's, yeah. and I think that this is not on men alone. I think that this is a trait that we need to understand lies within each and every one of us, which is the fear of being overpowered. And it comes back to the fear of death. And it's landed us in the most almighty mess that we are, are not using technology sensitively. And we are not working with nature from medicine to everything. We are working to suppress it. So, I, one of the things I appreciate also in your book is that you write it very poetically. This is a very evocative read. So tell us about that approach and, and what you're wanting to achieve with it. Um, well, I'm, I'm best known as a writer of fiction. Um, I've written genre fiction for many years. Um, I'm not fantastically well known, but I'm certainly well known and appreciated in my, in my genre. Um, and because of the rise of the internet, mostly, the publishing world has dramatically changed. And the main reason, the main, one of the main um, consequences of, of the rise of the internet is that it's allowed a lot of people to self-publish books, some of which are great, um, but there is pretty large proportion of those self-published works um, are, kind of clogging up um, the, the publishing world generally. Um, I, I liken it to the creation of a level playing field. Level, level playing fields are great um, because, you know, the publishing world in, in Britain, for instance, for instance, has in the past been very elitist and very traditional. So a level playing field, great. But the problem with the internet is that the level playing field is now so vast that nobody can hear anybody else because a million people are all shouting about their books at the tops of their voices. So essentially a couple of years ago, I just hit a dead end with my fiction. I was finding it increasingly difficult to sell. Um, and that, that issue in combination with the fact that Nikki and I went down to Devon and celebrated my 60th birthday and I just stumbled across this book, just gave me the idea I often find with my books that the title comes first, um, sometimes quite a long way before I actually write the book. And 
I can't exactly remember how it happened now, but I definitely had the, the, just that that title, I am Taurus, in my head. The moment I started thinking about the, the ball number 18 in Lascaux and actually looking at what it actually looked like and thinking, that's amazing. I've never come across that in all my reading around cave art. I've never been told that. Um, and of course, as I'm sure you'll be aware, the reason that, that, that this similarity is not remarked upon is that archaeologists find that very difficult. It's a natural human ability to see patterns in things. We call it paradolia. Um, but for, if you're an archaeologist, it's quite hard to make that leap into more metaphorical thinking. So what I wanted to do was tell a story which, which I quickly um, realized was an amazing story. Um, and I already knew some of the details. I mean, I'm a big fan of David Lewis Williams, who, who wrote a terrific book called The Mind in the Cave. Um, about cave art. Um, he's a South African professor. He also wrote an extraordinary book about the sand Bushman art and about Neolithic um, attitudes to art and, and myth-making. So um, I knew about Katel Hoyuk, for instance, um, in Anatolia. Um, so as I started, all these bits and pieces um, started to coagulate in my mind. And then I thought, hang on, Gilgamesh, yeah, I know about that. Um, and the story just kind of presented itself to me as a kind of walk through time around the Mediterranean, looking at the sacred bull. And then I hadn't realized until I started researching it that Spanish bullfighting essentially comes from Roman traditions. The Romans took it to um, Iberia. It then became quite an elitist, um, you know, event. Um, and then only comparatively recently, you know, in the 1900s, did it become much more of a Spanish social event to what it is now. Um, but that actually is a final outpost of the sacrifice that you were just talking about, the Roman sacrifice of the bull. Um, you know, the Romans had very particular ways of sacrificing the bull and Spanish bullfighting is a, is a Spanish um, outpost of that particular um, set of circumstances. And then going just to talk about the, the poetic writing, that's just my thing. I mean, I, I you know, <laughs> I've been doing, I've been writing for so long now. Um, it's just, you know, I also wanted to do something different. I wanted it to be a short book because I wanted it to be like, um, you know, a really nice slice of chocolate cake, a really intense hit. So it's quite a short book. It's only about 32,000 words or something. Um, and, you know, the poetic writing, um, allows me to give a, a little bit of license to my imagination. It is a factual book. It was properly researched um, and checked through. I, you know, I would say 95% of it is, is fact-based or reasonable speculation that other people have made um, with 5% you know, of, of fiction for extra effect, just to put the icing on the cake, as it were. Well, to me, it feels like a little bit of time travel because that's what I meant when oh, I right. said Provocative because it does feel like you're taking us right there and for the audience you're looking at the world through the bull's eyes the aurochs yeah. eyes so yes. it's um it, that's it's very special i just want to come back to um the ancient greeks tell us about what was going on around knossos and and taurus hmm. So um, Knossos is the perfect example of what you were talking about just now, the way that um, literate cultures, not just the Greeks, but in Sumeria and elsewhere, uh, Egypt, ancient Egypt as well, were changing their conception of what the sacred bull was. So by the time we get to Gilgamesh and later legends, um, we are looking at the sacred bull as an awesome extraordinary, amazing, dangerous, powerful creature that human beings, not just men, but mostly men, feel the need to dominate. And I agree with you. I, I think that that is very much uh, for reasons of dominating nature, which has very big elements of fear, um, you know, in that attitude. Um, at Knossos, they had a very particular and um, extraordinary form of this. Um, the Minoan culture um, was 
um, existed in various parts of Crete, but Knossos was a particular um, center. There was a, the King's Palace was there, for instance. Um, and they had this extraordinary um, performance called bull leaping. Um, now the, the um, bull leaping um, frescoes at the, um, at, at the what remains of the um, Knossos Palace are, are well known and they, they show things that are quite hard to believe that that a young person a young man or a young woman um dressed basically in a loincloth um often with quite long hair that could get in the way you know of the of their perception they um there were various ways of doing this they basically wanted to give a public performance to show their mastery of the ball now in essence this was um, a public um, acceptance of their of their journey from childhood into adulthood. It was kind of a rite of growing up, um, but it was also a performance and a, and a depiction of the mastery of human beings over nature, personified by the youth and the bull. So it is possible to um, with a bull that is that is not completely rampant and wild to, if you're sufficiently skilled, to leap up in various um, athletic configurations and toss yourself over the ball. You can either do that as a somersault, you can do it in a pike format, so with your legs and your arms, your, your front body compressed in what's known as the pike, you can do that. Those are the more dangerous extreme versions of the ritual. There were other versions, um, what can I say, much safer versions, um, in some versions, the bull would simply be led to an altar or some um, object or projection, and it would be it would be led so that its front feet would be um, on or near the altar, um, and then a person could just jump over. Um, those were the kind of um, you know less extreme, um, plausible, let's say you know not quite so extraordinarily scary versions versions of this ritual. Um, but we know from the Nikonosos depictions that, that there was no doubt that athletes were leaping over bulls. Sometimes the bull actually wouldn't be moving. Uh, it would be actually on its, on its belly with its feet um, in like that. And they would either jump over it or use the horns as a pivot over which they would jump. The, the bull didn't necessarily have to be moving. And that, that of course is a slightly safer version. Um, but an extraordinary thing to consider. And in fact, I don't think this is terribly common now, but, but there are um, places in southeast France where um, a kind of um, echo of this ritual still happens, um, but it's, it's not well known. Well, I was just thinking that we were attributing bullfighting and the need to, you know, to, to do this still only to exist in, in Spain, and I would add Portugal, although in Portugal the bull is not killed in bullfights. Yeah. Um, it, it's very ritualistic. But uh, I think we're forgetting our co cowboys and the uh, the rodeos that yes. are still going on. Yes, uh, that's true. Where, yes. So yes. there's definitely this thing there. Have you done any research into the um the hindu tradition and the the parts of india where the bull is considered to be sacred I did. yes um the chapter on the indian outpost of the sacred bull um at harappa is quite short i i could have gone to other cultures um and talked about how bulls are perceived, conceived and depicted in those cultures. But it struck me quite early on that this was essentially a Mediterranean story. Now, admittedly, I start in, you know, in the middle of France, which is which is a kind of a Mediterranean country, but, you know, more to the south and the north. Um, but I felt that I needed to be careful not to um, to dilute my Mediterranean story by going into other cultures. Um, so Obviously, the sacred bull is um, cows are, are um, a sacred animal in Hindu tradition. Uh, there is a sacred bull. Um, I think he's called Nandi, as I as I recall. 
um, and um, he is associated with Shiva. Um, so um, India is not actually that far away from Medi the Mediterranean. I mean, Alexander, you know, almost got to India in, in his various travels. So, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is certainly, there was certainly a link there. Um, but as I say, in this particular book, I do mention Nandi um, and some of the stories around Shiva in particular and Pavati. It's good uh, because there was a, a lot of crossover, actually, um, yes. through, through Persia and, and then into the, the, the Mediterranean. So, yes, absolutely. So that's that's very interesting. I was also wondering, because I'm thinking about how we have vestiges of, of this relationship with the bull. And we, you know, in the stock market, we have the bull market and we have... I think it's the bull in um, in New York, don't we? Where uh, the the stock market, the the statue mm. of the bull. Have you done any research around that association with um, with money and the bull? Not really. No, I, I confess I didn't. Um, I felt that my story naturally ended with the Spanish, um, and. Um, I suppose I could have, I could, America being the new world, as as it seemed to me in my very Eurocentric view for this book, um, I had, confess I hadn't thought about the, the rodeo. I'm giving you a that's sequel. A, that's a, yes, I should do an extra chapter, yeah. Um, actually, I have done an extra chapter, um, which I'm going to, um, uh, just a very short chapter for my Substack followers um, based around Cyprus. Um, there's not much evidence of the sacred bull on Cyprus, but there are some stories. And, and um, but actually, yeah, good point. But um, again, I, if I had thought about that, I think I would have said to myself, "That's the new world. Um, that kind of takes us well away from the Mediterranean. Maybe it I does. should do it that." Does. But um, but it does. But when you think about what the bull symbolizes in terms of potency and fertility. There's going to be also from from that potency and fertility to abundance, which of course astrologers will be well aware of, yeah. uh, which then takes it to money, and you could still. Ah, we froze again, didn't we? Okay, just <laughs> ten second freeze there. Um, yes, so, as you say, a strong association with with money, um, and um, uh, and I, and so I think markets, yes. So I think it's it's interesting to explore that side of it because we, you can almost see there's a um, Here we go again. <laughs> okay. Another phrase. Do do you think that? Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you think that the association between the bull in the say the American stock market um, is um, was a conscious move, or do you think that was just? Uh, do you think? Do you think the the um, the unconscious ideas and depictions we have of bulls actually led it, to the idea it, of it being a bull market? It's, it's a hard question to answer that because it depends on who was involved in mm. naming it mm. and who was involved in creating this, um, this sculpture. I think these symbols, as you know, are archetypes. Yes. Are deeply embedded within our DNA. And that although in recent history, we've started to become divorced from that, separated from that, this, it's coming back. But there are people who are very um, cognizant of the archetypes and the symbols and who do use them, um, even if a large proportion Part of the population has forgotten them mm. so i i in answer to your question i'm not sure it depends on who was involved mm. um but 
there is most definitely from an astrological perspective, the bull is a symbol of all of these things that we've been talking about, potency, fertility, nature, um, fecundity, and abundance, which of mm. course then leads to this link with money. So it, it, there's a web of associations that um, is created through centuries. And we can see that there are, they are still potent and powerful in our time. Absolutely, yes. And not just the bull. I mean, Leo is another extremely ancient um, uh, astrological sign. Um, and of course, it's no accident that the goat and the ram uh, two animals which were domesticated very, very early in in uh, post Ice Age human history are are there and are known to be very, very ancient constellations. What do you and make of course, Scorpio? Because of course, Scorpio is an interesting one. It's it is an extremely ancient star sign and symbol, um, but it's not a symbol that you would ex you would naturally think human beings would particularly focus upon. And yet there is evidence that Scorpio um, is a very, very ancient constellation, or at least, you know, symbol, along with Leo and Taurus. But you wouldn't think a scorpion would make that, would be that um, It's deadly. It's well, deadly. yes. yes. <laughs> it's very deadly. Uh, and I think it probably was very much a part of people's lives. But I think it goes back to the scarab beetle uh, with the ancient Egyptians as well, that, or is yeah. that camp? one of them is linked with the scarab beetle? Um, I, I think animals, as you've said, were an important part of people's lives because they were living in nature. They weren't living yeah. alongside it. They were a part of it. Yeah. Um, and so things like snakes and scorpions would have been a very important part of their lives and deaths, I think. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think that there would be, it's not surprising that there would be a great deal of mythology that would be growing up around it. And, you know, if you take the, the symbol of Scorpio and what it means in astrology, it is life, death power control it's all those all that stuff of mm. mortality mm. and and that's what it symbolizes that's what it's about you see that in the gilgamesh myth in fact because um scorpion guards are mentioned uh, at the gates um before gilgamesh goes into the deathly realms there are scorpion guards in the in the correct position that they would be um you know, the one of the cardinal points in that myth. Um, so yes, yeah, they're almost the guardians of the gates of death, almost. Not quite, but, but they they are symbolically almost there. Well, Stephen, I I I'm inviting you and urging you to uh, do. Oh, you've Stephen. you've gone again, and I said again, didn't quite catch that. I am inviting you, Stephen, to write more books uh, exploring other connections with other animals. Mm. Thank you for, for this one. <laughs> I've written um, I Am the Moon. Um, when I, when I um, offered this book to the people who have published um, the book, Collective Ink Publishing, um, I mentioned um, that I, was, I would, would and could do more. So um, I haven't offered them I Am the Moon yet, but depending on how this goes, that one is ready. And that was a really interesting trek through even greater um, um, swathes of time. Um, I'm quite tempted to do I Am Leo because there, because there is actual hard evidence of how human beings um, interacted with um, feline archetypes, uh, even as far back as Katal Huyuk, the leopard goddess. Um, so that could be a really interesting one. Um, so yeah. Yes, I look forward to and hopefully will be more. I look forward to that. And I look forward to I am the moon as well. Please get on and publish it. <laughs> well, we'll see how I am Taurus does. If it does well, then I shall certainly be offering it to my publishers and hopefully they'll say yes. Good. Yeah. Well, I um, I wish you all the best. 
uh, for your sake and ours as well. Cool. Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. Now, next time. Ah, now, hang on. Before we do that, Stephen, if people wanted to find out more about your work, uh, where do they go? Okay. So um, they can basically just Google me. So I'm, I'm, uh, I am have a, um, a Substack um, site. I have a, um, a very extensive blog. Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, just Google the name Stephen Palmer. Um, I am Taurus and you'll find me. Well, I'll be putting a link to the book in the description box and then uh, we can put some more links. Oh, brilliant. To thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again. And thank you all for watching next time. Um, we're going to be talking about the seven ages of man. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>